Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining. Good afternoon, good evening. Again, thank you so much for joining. I see many familiar names, many new names. We'll get started in just a few moments, allowing everyone to sign in. But again, thanks to all of you for being here right on time. Hi, welcome, thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for being on time. Welcome everyone. We'll give everyone just a few more moments to join. Ooh. My apologies. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone. We are gonna go ahead and get started to make sure that we end on time. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here this evening. We're super excited to have you. Uh, welcome to Families for Everglades, Invasive Species in the Everglades. So tonight we're talking all about invasive species. So think to yourself, when you think of an invasive species, what first comes to mind? Uh, it might be a Burmese python, a tegu lizard, or a green iguana. But what about some of the lesser known species of invasive species like brown anoles, even feral cats, or many different species of plants? So tonight we're going to go over what is a native species, what is a non-native exotic species, and also what is an invasive species in the Everglades, how they impact our environment, and what different agencies are doing to help manage invasives, and then simple solutions that we can do at home to help prevent native species, or I'm sorry, help prevent invasive species and help native species in Florida and the Everglades. So before we get started, let's dive into a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we are the Everglades Foundation. It is a nonprofit environmental organization that works to restore the Everglades through science, advocacy, and education. We're part of the education team known as the Everglades Literacy Program. So the Everglades Literacy Program is a statewide program and my name is Kim Gooch. I'm the Everglades Literacy Program Coordinator, and I'm located in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we're joined here today by some members of our education team, and they're happy to answer any questions that you may have about invasive species or anything else in the Everglades. So speaking of questions, uh, you'll notice that we do have the chat closed and the Q&A open. So if you do have any questions this evening, please be sure to use the Q&A to ask us questions. Someone from the education team or myself will be able to answer them. We will also be utilizing polls throughout this presentation for engagement and trivia questions throughout the evening. Uh, so make sure you're paying attention to some of those invasive species because you might be quizzed on it later. So with that, let's dive into some definitions. There are a couple of different definitions out there when it comes to native, non-native exotic and invasive species. First, we have native species. Native species are animals and plants that live in an area without any human intervention. 
So these species have evolved and thrived in a particular ecosystem. And an example in the Everglades is the American alligator. It's a native species that has adapted to living in the Everglades and it can be impacted by non-native species. So a non-native or exotic species are animals and plants living outside their native rangers as a result of human activity. It can be intentionally or accidentally been introduced to an ecosystem, but it is usually not known to disrupt the natural processes of that specific ecosystem. An example is a freshwater fish like the common carp. It has been introduced and can be used for sport or eating. And then of course we have invasive species. These are non-native or exotic plants or animals that cause harm to the environment, economy, or human health. They can cause environmental impacts. This can lead to the extinction of native plants and animals, destroy biodiversity, and permanently change habitats. It can also have economic impacts. So annually about $120 billion is spent nationwide and hundreds of millions of dollars are spent in Florida just to combat invasive species alone. An example of an invasive species that we see on screen and that you probably see all over South Florida is the green iguana. So the green iguana is actually native to Central and South America reported in the 1960s, most likely as a released or an escaped pet, and they are now on Florida's prohibited pet list. They can cause damage to landscapes, can transmit salmonella, and they also eat nicker bean, which is a host plant of the native endangered species, the Miami blue butterfly. So how do the animals get here and why do they love it so much? So Florida is a hot spot for biological invasions. It is one of the four states with the highest number of non-native species. Hawaii, California, and Louisiana are the other three. And according to Everglades CISMA, which is the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, Florida is home to more non-native reptile and amphibian species than anywhere else in the entire world. Exotic and invasive species can compete with native species for natural resources like food, water, shelter, and space. The Everglades provides a lot of these natural resources for native species, and of course, invasive species can compete with those native species. The example you see here on screen is the Mayan cichlid. It was first discovered in Florida Bay in 1983, now established in South Florida all the way up to Lake Okeechobee. It's actually native to Central and South America, and it's an aggressive eater, usually first to find the food source and fights off the native bluegill species. So how did they get here? Well, unfortunately, most introductions are caused by human activity. And a big one is the pet trade. So more than 80% of the non-native reptiles and amphibians in Florida arrived here through the pet trade, whether it's released pets, escaped pets, or even aquarium releases. Uh, many non-native species have escaped from their cages, aquariums, or garden beds into the wild. And a lot of times people don't realize that they have a pet that they can no longer take care of. So that's why it's important to choose your pets wisely and never release non-native species into the wild. Also, people will import invasive or non-natives as ornamentals. Typically, they were brought over from another country or another area due to aesthetic reasons, and some don't have much of an impact, but some can turn invasive and wreak havoc on native species. Some species are brought over to combat another species. They might have been brought over to help fix another issue. For example, some trees were brought over to the Everglades to help dry up the Everglades, as well as some species of insects and invertebrates were brought over to help eat other species, but in return come, become invasive species themselves. And then there's also accidental. Some animals accidentally, or some animals or plants may be hitched a ride on a cargo ship in stowaways. Uh, many of these ships come into Florida ports every single day and could be carrying non-native species. So 
So we have a few more examples on screen, one of them being the wild hog or feral pig. Uh, they're actually non-native to Florida, but they've been here for hundreds of years. Introduced in the 1500s by Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, it competes with native wildlife for food, uh, but it unfortunately can carry disease and damages agricultural crops, lawns, and landscape. You also have the European starling, uh, brought over from England in 1890, thanks to William Shakespeare enthusiasts, and they can compete with native birds like the purple martin for nesting boxes, and they can also damage food crops and steal grain from farms. All right, I hope you were paying attention so far because we have some trivia riddles. So I'm going to launch the poll, and the poll should pop up on your screen. So this is riddle quiz one. So the first question, which invasive species is it? Central and South America is where I got my start. Florida is now where I can run and dart. My diet consists of crops as well as rare and endangered plants. Just like sunbathers, you will never see me wearing pants. Is it the Cuban anole, the pike killfish, the green iguana, or Cuban tree frog? Number two. We transfer the mites that love to bite. With the native birds, we love to fight. With our large flocks, we cause much harm to trees, houses, and old McDonald's farm. Is it the monk parakeet, European starling, peacock, or African gray parrot? And then number three, I have a long snout and my tail is hairy. The diseases I spread are kind of scary. I uproot plants and leave deer-like tracks. In Arkansas, I'm known as a razorback. Is it the wild hog, nine-banded armadillo, feral cat, or mongoose? So take a guess in the poll. Don't worry, these are all completely anonymous and we'll be sure to go over the answers with you. Thank you, everyone. I see those answers coming in. All right, I'll give everyone just a few more moments to answer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. We can share the results. So the first question, number one, is the green iguana. So congratulations to everyone who got that one right. Number two, is the European starling. So we had about 42% get that one right, great job. And number three is the wild hog. Great job, everyone. We had about 77% get that one right. So thank you everyone for participating. And again, make sure you're paying attention to some of these species because we have more trivia polls to come. So how do we understand and manage these invasive species in South Florida? Well, the answer is the invasion curve. And this was adapted from invasive, invasive plants and animal policy framework by the UF IFAS Extension Office. So as we mentioned, invasive species are one of the biggest threats that the Everglades faces. It can affect Everglades restoration by displacing native species and transform large expanses into ecosystems that differ radically from their historical structure, functioning, and provision of ecosystem services, which are those free benefits we get from nature. If you look at the X and Y axes on the curve, it shows that the longer the invasive species remains in a system, the more time it has to infest an area. And the more infested a species is, the least likely it will be eradicated and the cost to control increases. So if you look at the arrow on the screen at the introduction, it is at the prevention curve. So this is where the species is absent from the ecosystem and early detection is critical. If you move up the curve, you'll see that the next stage is eradication. Early detection is very critical and, and eradication is where a complete removal may be possible, but it is more costly than prevent prevention. It's important to monitor, research, and identify effects on the environment. And then uh, there might be a small population of localized population. 
Up next on the curve is containment. So this is where public awareness typically begins. We call that citizen science and we'll uh, introduce how you can do that at home. Uh, but containment is where you wanna take immediate action to stop the spreading. Eradication becomes less likely because of the population size. And the goals are to contain the population to one area and prevent the spreading. And then last but not least on the curve, you can see where it goes very high, very red. The control cost goes up and the area infested goes up is resource protection and long-term management stage. Eradication is impossible. The species is too widespread and too abundant and efforts are aimed at finding the most feasible way to control the species. So we're gonna introduce to you some uh, invasive species and their stages on the curve. We're going to take a look at the Everglades Dirty Dozen. So these are from the Everglades CISMA, again, that Everglades Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And the Dirty Dozen, dozen are important for the public to be aware of because they're established and spreading in South Florida. They're easy to identify and they are causing or likely to cause environmental harm and may threaten to harm the economy or public well-being. So probably some of the most famous invasive species that you've heard of in Florida is the Burmese python and tegu lizard. Burmese python from Southeast Asia, they can get about 12 feet long, but some can reach 18 feet. And they have been introduced by escaped or released pets, suspected accidental released. They compete with native species for food and they eat threatened or endangered species like the Key Largo wood rat and the wood stork. On their, their stage on the curve is resource protection and long-term management. You also have the tegu lizard from South America. It's actually the Argentine black and white tegu lizard, so from Argentina. Averages about five feet long, escaped or released pets, known to seek affection actually. Uh, but they eat eggs of native species like the American alligator and that can impact ground nesting wildlife like gopher tortoises, American crocodiles, and sea turtles. So some more other species of reptiles that you might not think about are the chameleon and Nile monitor. So the chameleon is from Old World, that's Africa, Madagascar, Southern Europe, and Asia, introduced as escaped or released pets. They eat native insects, small frogs and lizards, and small mammals and birds, and they have a high reproductive rate. Uh, so if you do have them as a pet, it's important to keep that in mind. And their stage on the curve is eradication. Up next, we have the Nile monitor from Sub-Sahara Africa. They were introduced as escaped or released pets. Uh, you're no longer allowed to have them as a pet. They eat mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and eggs. And they're a threat to native wildlife like burrowing owls, sea turtles, and American crocodiles. And their stage on the curve is containment. Up next are some smaller animals that you might not think about, like the Cuban tree frog. Originally from Cuba, they were introduced as a stowaway on cargo shipments. They look like Florida's native tree frogs, and they can actually eat native tree frogs and insects that would be food for native tree frogs, as well as they emit a noxious skin secretion uh, that can be irritating to humans. It's important to report Cuban tree frogs that you see. I know I see them all the time in my backyard. And their stage on the curve is resource protection and long-term management. We also have the giant African snail that is an, an invasive species. They are from East Africa. They were a, a released pet in the 1960s used for religious rituals in 2011, and they have a voracious appetite. They can eat over, eat over 500 species of plants and can wipe out a small farm overnight, leaving a foul smelling excrement in their wake. Uh, they can lay about 100 eggs per month for eight to 10 years, so a very high reproductive rate. And they can also eat the stucco off of houses and paint off of cars if they do not have enough calcium. Uh, they can spread human diseases and plant pathogens, so that's why it's important to report this species and their stage on the curve is eradication. There's also many species of invasive fish, uh, excuse me, invasive fish, and two species on the dirty dozen list are the bullseye snakehead and the lionfish. The bullseye snakehead is from tropical Asian, Asia. Their introduction is unknown, perhaps as a food fish, and they compete with native, native fish for food like small fish, crayfish, lizards, snakes, turtles, and snails. Uh, 
What's really interesting is they can breathe air, which allows them to occupy habitats with poor water quality that some native species of fish might not be able to occupy. You can even fish for them and eat them. They say that they have a mild taste. Uh, their stage on the curve is resource protection and long-term management. A more famous fish that you might have heard of or seen is the lionfish. They're from the Indo Indian or Pacific Ocean. They were introduced as an aquarium release, whether it was intentional or accidental. They have 18 venomous spines used for protection, so nothing really eats them, uh, but they can eat over 70 marine fish and invertebrates and competes with native fish like grouper and snapper. Uh, but a great way to help is by spearfishing them and you can also eat them. A lot of times you can find them at your local grocery store. And their stage on the curve is resource protection and long-term management. Now we can't forget to talk about plants. There are a lot of species of invasive plants in the Everglades and there are four of them on the dirty dozen list. So the two here we have are the Australian pine and the old world climbing fern. Australian pine is from Australia and Southeast Asia, introduced in the 1800s for ditch and canal stabilization. They can grow 100 feet tall and shades out native plants and their shallow roots can increase beach erosion, which unfortunately takes over nesting areas of endangered injured sea turtles and threatened American crocodiles. You can actually remove seedlings by hand or use herbicide treatment if they're on your property. And their stage on the curve is long-term management. Now there's also the old world climbing fern from Africa, Asia, and Australia. It was introduced as escaped cultivation in the 1960s. It can dominate native vegetation by forming a dense canopy and can serve as a fire ladder. As you can see in the picture, it carries that fire up into the tree canopy, uh, can canopies. Uh, what's really interesting is that a species of arthropod has been released to feed on the fern as a part of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, also known as SERP. Uh, something else you can do is remove the fern from your property using herbicide treatments, and you can also plant native species in its plant in its place. And its sage on the curve is also the long-term management plan. And then we also have the Brazilian pepper tree and air potato. Uh, Brazilian pepper trees from South America, imported as the, in the late 1890s and 1920s as landscape ornamental, all right? They wanted it to look pretty. Uh, and that also forms a dense canopy that shades out native plants. So it takes away that sunlight and displaces rare and endangered plants. It's also a host for an invasive species of root weevil that eats citrus that can be bad for our agricultural crops. It can also ca cause a rash in some people. Uh, and again, you can remove seedlings by, uh, by hand on your property. And you can also plant comparable native shrubs like the varnish leaf, elderberry, and sea grapes. They are also on the long-term management plan. And then last on the dirty dozen species list, is the air potato from Asia and Africa, introduced to Florida in 1905 as a medicinal plant. Uh, they have large heart-shaped leaves that grow very fast and it can smother other plants. So shading out that sunlight uh, so other plants cannot grow below. And these vines can change entire plant communities. They do have bul bulbils. They're a member of the yam family. Uh, and you can actually remove those underground tubers by hand. That's a great way to help. And they are also on the long-term management plan. All right, did you remember all of that? Because now you're going to be, uh, or now we're going to play a, rid a riddle game. So just as the first one, we have another poll that we're going to launch. So I just launched it and I'll read the questions out loud again. So number one, from Southeast Asia, I'm a popular pet. I really do like it here in Florida where it is humid and wet. Eating endangered species are a part of what I pray, prompting park officials to not invite me to stay. Is it the tegu lizard, the Nile monitor, the chameleon or the Burmese python? Number two, I am known to flower all year long. When dispersed seeds make my survival chances strong. My roots grow through the sand where you play, making it hard for sea turtles to lay. Is it the Australian pine, melaleuca, or Brazilian pepper tree? 
or the air potato. <laughs> and then number three, uh, this species of frog comes from the West Indies, feeding on native green tree frog species. Reducing native frogs through hungry eating, skin secretion stop birds from feasting. Which invasive species is it? The Cuban anole, the Cuban tree frog, Asian swamp eel, or the bromeliad weevil? All right, so just like last time, this is completely anonymous. Feel free to guess, and it has popped up on screen. I see some great questions so far in the Q&A. Like you can use the I've Got One app. Great job, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Why is it called an air potato? They're in the potato family. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. We can go through it together. So number one was the Burmese Python. So great job to the 44% of people who got that one right. Number two was the Australian pine. So we were kind of all over the place, but uh, I would say 40% of people got that one right. So great job. And then number three, 84% got that one correct. And that is the Cuban tree frog. So thank you everyone for participating. I know there was a lot of answers to choose from. So let's talk about some impacts of invasive species. Now there are many non-native species in the Everglades that do not cause much harm, but a lot of these invasive exotic species can cause detrimental effects to the ecosystem. They can displace and compete with native species. As we saw with many of the dirty dozen, invasive species can take over a native species habitat and compete with native species for natural resources like food, water, shelter, sunlight, and space. It can also permanently, permanently change habitats. Uh, it can cause a loss of biodiversity and functions of wetlands. Wetlands like sawgrass marshes help to filter and clean out water. And an invasive species like the Melaleuca uh, can actually change wetlands into dry habitats and compete with native sawgrass plants. Uh, the Melaleuca is a plant that you see on screen. Originally from New Guinea and Australia, it now inhabits more than 400,000 acres in Southern and Central Florida. It was introduced in 1906 as potential commercial timber and later sold as an ornamental. And it was actually planted to help dry up the Everglades and decrease mosquito populations. Uh, what's also pretty bad about the Melaleuca is that their stems contain seed capsules and any damage to that tree that cuts water flow uh, results in a seed release. And a single tree can store about two to 20 million seeds. Uh, native species, or excuse me, invasive species can also kill native plants and trees and cause habitat loss. Uh, this can impact the over 70 threatened or endangered species in the Everglades. And it can also damage crops, which we know is important for people's livelihood and food protection. We have another example on screen. This is the monk parakeet. Uh, they're from Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina, and Brazil often found near large water sources. They were introduced as a release pet and they are not afraid of humans and they often compete with native wildlife for resources. So we also have some common invasive species that we see in our backyards all the time. And a lot of times we might not realize that these animals are not from here. Uh, uh, many of them have been here for a really long time, and they have become established into urban and suburban areas. An example you see on screen is the Muscovy duck. Uh, so the Muscovy duck is actually not from here. It's native to Central and Southern America, uh, but it is now found in Florida and Texas. 
It was illegally released primarily by private individuals for ornamental purposes or pets, and they can be extremely prolific. Local populations can increase dramatically in a short period of time. There are some controversies out there of some people who enjoy the ducks and others who consider them a nuisance, uh, but they compete with native species and can cause damage to property as well as transmit disease. So some other common invasive species that you might see all the time include the Cuban brown anole. Did you know that this species is actually invasive? It's not from here. Uh, it's from Cuba and the Bahamas, and it expands its range very quickly and outcompetes and consumes many species of native lizards, like the green anole, which is the native lizard to Florida. They were introduced in the early 1970s unintentionally as on cargo shipments from the Caribbean, and now they are often the dominant species in the given environment. We also have the blue tilapia, uh, which you might hear a lot because it's a popular food fish for us. Uh, it's native to North Africa and the Middle East, and now it is widespread in Florida's lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. It was introduced by escaped or intentional releases from aquarium fisheries, and it's actually tolerance of salt water and can be found in some marine habitats. And like I mentioned, a great way to help out with this species is by eating them. It's a mild white fish, and they're often farm raised and sold in grocery stores. Something new that I learned is that fire ants are actually an invasive species. They're not from here, they're native to South America, and they were accidentally introduced through ports in the panhandle. And as we know, we don't wanna get stung by fire ants. Their stings can last up to 10 days. Uh, there's not really a permanent solution for them, but a species of forid fly has been released in the Southeastern US to control colonies, which is pretty interesting. And then something that you might be surprised is actually feral cats. So feral cats and domestic cats are not a Florida are not a part of Florida's natural ecosystem, right? They're not naturally from here. In fact, if a cat is living in the wild, a single individual free range cat can kill 100 or more birds and mammals in just one year. They compete with native wildlife and can spread diseases. Uh, so that's why it's really important to uh, eliminate food sources for free range cats and keep bird feeders away on your property. Something else that you can do is be a responsible cat owner. Get cats spayed or neutered and then bring cats indoor when possible. All right, we have one more trivia riddle quiz. Uh, so again, uh, just like we've done for number one and two, I'm going to launch these in the polls. All right, number one. Hey mate, I'm from down under. The water from the Everglades is what I plunder. I am known as the true terror of the glades, an aggressive invader. Many wish we were old maids. Is it the Ligodium, air potato, melaleuca, or the Australian pine? Number two, from out of Africa across the big blue, I outcompete other fish, perhaps one you knew. Tolerant of the cold spreading through the state, no known enemies, taking away places others choose to mate. Is that the blue tilapia, lionfish, Mayan cichlid, or blue tang? And then number three, we got our start being dumped in the wild. Native animals have us eating in style. We love to feast on native birds and reptiles, doing our best hunting when the sun rests for a while. Is this a wild hog, feral cat, nutria, or a squirrel monkey? So I'll go ahead and give everyone a few moments to answer the questions. And again, they're all anonymous. All right, everyone, just a few more minutes to answer. Great job, everyone. All right, I'm going to end the poll and launch the results. 
So number one is the Melaleuca. So we had about 51% get that right. Congratulations. Number two is the blue tilapia. Uh, we had about 52% guess that one correct. So great job. And number three is the feral cat. Uh, so great job. We had about 85% get that one right. And I saw in the Q&A, someone asked, is a feral cat a good pet? Uh, it is always important to choose your pets wisely. And uh, if you have a domesticated cat, you don't want to set it free. <laughs> So great job, everyone. Thank you for participating. So what can you do to help? There are many things that we can do to help prevent and stop the spread of invasive species. And here are just a few of the ways you can help in your area. Number one, like I just mentioned, is be a responsible pet owner. Don't let it loose and do your research. Never release unwanted, unwanted pets into the wild. If you can no longer take care of a pet, there are many options that you have. Uh, it's also really important to do your research before you get a new pet, even if it's something like a cat or a dog. Ask yourself, how long does the pet live? How big does it get? What does it eat? And also, is it illegal to own this pet? You can check your local rules and regulations and see maybe where that pet came from. You can also surrender exotic pets. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has an exotic pet amnesty program. If you can no longer take care of the species, uh, you can return it through this program and you'll face no legal penalty penalties and you will not pay a fee to surrender your pet through the program. Uh, FWC will help to facilitate that adoption process to rehome re -home your pet. In fact, every year FWC hosts an exotic pet amnesty day. You also want to report invaders. So this is where you can participate in that citizen science. You wanna keep your eyes open and cameras ready. Uh, you can help FWC by submitting reports of non-native species in the wild. There's actually three different ways that you can report them. There's a free smartphone app. It's called I've Got One, and it's great for lower priority species like non-native lizards and iguanas. Uh, you can visit their website online, www.ivegotone.org. You will create it, an account and then you will create your report. And again, it's perfect for low priority species. And then uh, a great way to help out is by calling the hotline. That is 1-888-I've-GOT-ONE. Uh, and that is great for those high priority species like non-native snakes, monitor lizards, and tegu lizards. And then of course, we always encourage you to learn more. You can attend public workshops on Burmese pythons or other invasive species. There's the Python Patrol Program, which is a no cost training program that helps to, uh, you can actually become a python hunter and learn to identify the pythons, report your sightings and help capture them. Uh, and also there are many different iguana technical assistance workshops that helps to empower homeowners uh, to manage uh, green iguanas on your property. And that's just a few. Uh, there's also many other ways to combat invasive species really all over the state, as well as with many different federal programs. Uh, with Burmese pythons, uh, something that I find really interesting is the Python Detector Dog Program. Uh, it's through FWC, and it's actually uh, dogs that are trained to hunt uh, Burmese pythons in the wild. It's a black lab named Truman and a point setter named Eleanor. They go out five days a week with a dog handler and an FWC biologist to search for pythons. We also have the Florida Python Challenge every year, which is an exciting conservation effort. Uh, in the year 2021, more than 600 people participated in this 10-day competition, and they removed 223 Burmese pythons. And you also want to make sure to check the prohibited non-native species list. Uh, so we'll send you that link in the follow-up email with all of our resources, um, but there is a new rule that includes 16 high-risk non-native reptiles, including Burmese pythons, iguanas, and tegu lizards. But if you do have an iguana or a tegu lizard as a pet, you can still apply for a permit to have that pet. Uh, that list also includes aquatic invertebrates, freshwater fish, and marine fish, as well as mammals and birds. And then it's important to check your uh, uh, different federal, state, and local removal laws and ordinances in place. Many different areas have different rules when it comes to removing invasive or exotic species on your property. 
Uh, one thing's for sure that you cannot capture an invasive or non-native species and release it somewhere else in Florida. That's why you always wanna make sure that you're reporting invasive species that you see. Another great way to help is by planting native species. You can join the Native Plant Society in your area. There's actually many different local chapters, as well as if you visit their website, there are plenty of different uh, resources for, use to, for you to use. You can research native plants for your area, and you can even type in your zip code or city, and they can give you resources for native plants. Native uh, plants can help attract native species like birds and and insects and butterflies and pollinators. And that's a great way to attract native species to your home or to your schoolyard. And there's also Florida Friendly Landscaping, which is through UF IFAS, and that promotes the good stewardship of Florida's natural resources. Uh, they help to uh, work with residents, business owners, and school grounds to create and maintain beautiful yards using research-based, environmentally sustainable landscaping practices. And they also have a training opportunity, workshops, and educational services. So we talk a lot about invasive species in the Everglades, but there's actually many other threats to the Everglades. And something that we all need is that fresh water. Uh, but unfortunately, the Everglades has changed over time. Now half its original size, the remaining Everglades ecosystem still encompasses about 3 million acres. In the last 100 years, the Everglades has been altered, changing the natural flow of water due to draining and dredging for agriculture, infrastructure, and flood control. We are living in a reduced, disconnected, and thirsty Everglades. This has negative impacts on our freshwater, saltwater, and brackish estuaries, as well as all the native plants and animals that live there. And this is why it's important to teach the next generation of conservation stewards to continue the mission of protecting and restoring the Everglades. And that's why we're here tonight. So while invasive species are a serious threat to the Everglades, some other threats include habitat loss and degradation, nutrient pollution, overconsumption, and of course, water quality and quantity issues. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, this just shows some of those impacts of changing that natural flow of water in the Everglades. In the middle of the screen, we have Lake Okeechobee, which unfortunately is suffering uh, with water quality issues such as excess nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, and that's being pushed out into our Gulf Coast and Atlantic Coast estuaries. Uh, that can result in toxic blue-green algae, which can be uh, toxic for our health, as well as it can cause um, algae blooms, uh, resulting in fish kills, seagrass die-off, and that yucky, mucky blue-green algae on the water that can really impact our coastal communities uh, with the health, economy, and well-being. Uh, we're also seeing that blue-green algae mix with red algae and causing exacerbated red tide. In South Florida, because we have less fresh water making its way down through the historic Everglades wetlands, that fresh water that would naturally be cleaned with the wetlands and percolate down into our aquifer, and then also empty out into Florida Bay and Everglades National Park, uh, we're seeing a drier Everglades National Park as well as less fresh water making its way down into Florida Bay, uh, causing hypersaline bays or water that is too salty. Uh, we're also seeing um, drier Everglades with unwanted forest fires and then a, not enough water being able to restore our aquifer. So these are just some of the reasons why restoration is important to all of us. So I know that we had a lot of information in this PowerPoint today. So thank you so much for participating in the chat and participating in the Q&A as well as the polls. Uh, we'll be sure to send you uh, our invasive species resources. Uh, so in the next few days, you'll get a follow-up email that will include our Families for Everglades resource packet uh, with information all about um, you know, different invasive species and native species, some of the links and lessons that we talked about today, as well as some information. Uh, you can see here we have some uh, great videos to share as well as some great lessons.
So now that you're experts, uh, we have some next steps for you. Of course, the resources. So like I said, we'll provide for you some of those great Everglades resources, links and lessons about invasive species. And then we want you to report invaders. The Everglades need you to participate in citizen science and report invasive species uh, by calling the hotline 888-I've-GOT-ONE or visiting the website or smartphone app. And then of course, learn more. It's up to you to learn more and help protect the Everglades ecosystem. Uh, you wanna make sure to choose your pets wisely, do your research, check out your local ordinances to learn rules and regulations and attend workshops on invasive species and native species in your area. And a big thank you from the Everglades Literacy Program. Uh, we are uh, the education team, like I said, and our goal is to really empower the next generation of conservation stewards by investing in teachers to drive cultural change within schools for the benefit of local and ecological communities. Uh, so if you're new to our program today, we'll definitely send you an email uh, with a lot of resources that we'd love to share with you. We offer our free standards aligned K through 12 interdisciplinary curriculum. We have additional and instructional resources, free virtual and in-person Everglades literacy teacher trainings, classroom presentations, field trip opportunities, and community partners throughout the state of Florida. And you can learn more on our website, evergladesliteracy.org. And with that, uh, again, just another big thank you from the Everglades education team. Um, thank you for being here tonight and your interest to learn more about the Everglades and learn more about invasive species in the Everglades. Uh, I do wanna point out the two native species on screen. It's actually the American alligator and the American crocodile. And there is no other place in the entire world where you can find them side by side uh, than the Everglades. So Marjorie Stoneman Douglas did say it best when there are no other Everglades in the world. Uh, so thank you all, you are free to go. We'll be sure to send you a follow-up email in the next few days, uh, but I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. We'll try to stick around to answer uh, just a few more questions in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.